Church, it's good to see you this morning. I'm Wade. I'm a member here, and uh, Ben has asked me uh, to uh, speak this morning to you. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, um, I don't want you to be alarmed because what I'm about to tell you is going to be, we're going to go through chapters 8 and 9 of 1 Corinthians. Everybody breathe. It's going to be all right. Uh, I promise to be as brief as you allow me to be. So if you'll listen quick, uh, I promise to be quick. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen. We'll see. Um, so uh, 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, we're going to be looking at um, two chapters that are going to seem to be completely opposite of one another. Sometimes, <clears throat> Paul, if you read, you, you have to remember first and foremost, we're reading a letter. Uh, we're reading a snippet of a letter that was written to a particular church at a particular time. We're, there was no chapters. Uh, there were no verses. Uh, it was all just one big hodgepodge of a letter, and they would read it amongst the people in the church at Corinth. So remembering that will help you as we transition from chapter 8 to chapter 9 because it's going to seem like they have nothing to do with one another. Uh, they, it's going to go from uh, one topic to seemingly another topic, but I hope that you'll, that you'll kind of lean in and you'll give me a minute to be able to kind of really talk it through with you because I think <clears throat> the essence of both chapters are going to be extremely beneficial for us as believers and us as the church. And it's going to deal with primarily what we put emphasis on in our life. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I realize some of the things that I, that I put emphasis on at an early age uh, doesn't really matter anymore. I can remember in high school and thinking, well, if this girl doesn't look at me or this girl doesn't talk to me, my life is over. Uh, or if I do bad in this one class or if I do bad on this one test, my life is completely over. Or if I don't get this job or if I don't get this opportunity that my life is completely over, I call it the one kid versus three kid parenting syndrome. And you parents that have had multiple kids understand when you have your first kid, you wrap them in bubble wrap and you hope to God nothing happens to them. You really and truly, like if, I, I can remember, <clears throat> we went to get our daughter Abigail in, in Texas and I remember uh, we went to the hospital and everything's good in the hospital because you got nurses, you got people helping take care of the baby. And so you're like, this is easy. This is gonna be fine, this parenting thing, no problem. And then you take them home for the first time. You're like, why does this child hate me? Um, why does this child cry all the time? Uh, I, I'm, I only want the best for it. But I can remember uh, uh, Cherry and I at, at like 2 o'clock in the morning waking up and, and looking over into this tiny little bassinet and wondering if the baby was still breathing. So, you know, we stuck a mirror under her nose to make sure she was alive. Um, then God let us have two more kids. And by the third kid, we turned the music up as loud as we possibly could. And we closed as many doors between us and her. And if she could scream over the loud music and the muffleness of all the doors, we knew she was hurt. Because you know, as parents, there is, there is real cries and then there's cries for attention. And most of the time it was a cry for attention. What does that mean? It means we learned. It means the things that we put emphasis on at the beginning, we learned some things matter, some things don't. Some things are more important than others. Some things matter more than others. And that's what Paul's going to deal with. Because guess what we get to deal with today in chapter 8? Food sacrifice to idols. Anybody guilty of that? If you are, we need to talk after church. Um, I just want to have a discussion with you. No ju little judgment, but not real judgment. But on the surface, you would think to yourself, food sacrifice to idols, that that doesn't have anything to do with me. But what we're going to see in these, in these two chapters is it has, it has a great deal to do with us. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of walk through chapter 8, kind of give you a big picture of what I think Paul is trying to say. And then chapter 9, uh, we're going we're gonna to dive deep. Is that okay? All right, everybody shake your head. Fantastic. All right, grab your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at verse 1. Now concerning food offered to idols. So, so what's happening here is Paul has obviously received questions from the Corinthian church about what is permissible and what is okay. And also he has heard stories about people within the church who have 
who have started to use sayings to excuse things that they wanted to do or they wanted to be a part of or the freedoms or the liberties that they thought that they had. In chapter 10 later, you'll see Paul deals with a saying, all things are lawful. That was a saying in the Corinthian church at the time to excuse something that they really wanted to do. Well, you're going to see that in chapter 8. Look what it says. It says, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that, quote, all of us possess knowledge. So this is another saying that people were saying in the Corinthian church. And where it was coming from, we're, we're, we're understanding, it was, it was from the spiritually mature or the ones who, who had been a Christian longer than others. And what they would do is they would look at the, the new believers who would come in and it would have questions, who, who would have concerns about maybe some of the liberties these, uh, these, these more mature believers were doing. And they would say, why? why are you doing this? Why are you allowing yourself to be a part of this? Why are you listening to this? And they're saying, well, we all have knowledge, but we have more knowledge because we are deeper in the faith than you. So Paul's having to... To, to kind of talk through that. So look what he says. He says, uh, we all possess knowledge. This knowledge, quote unquote, <clears throat> puffs up, but love builds up. Huge point to this whole thing. Verse two right there. Knowledge puffs up, but love does more. We can have, listen, we can have knowledge all day long. And by God's grace, I hope every day that you are growing closer in your relationship with Christ and you are growing closer in the intimacy that is the study of God's word. But it can never get to the place where we feel puffed up or we feel like we know more or we are better than somebody else. Because that puffs up and love does what? It builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he doesn't know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many quote-unquote gods and many quote-unquote lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things are and for whom we exist, one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we all, with whom all things, and through whom we exist. So, so just take a step back. Paul's saying, "Listen, there's only one God. Only one God. So any any other quote unquote gods that are talked about, or any quote unquote lords that are talked about, are nothing. Even though." They are talked about. There, there is, there is nothing. They, they were living in a, in a, in a city where, where there were idols to everything. There was worship of everything. You could go around the corner and find a, 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 a temple or, or something built to worship any god you wanted to. And yet Paul's reminding them, there's only one god. So everybody, be cool. Everybody, we're on the same page here. One God, and I, and, and I need to un help you understand that because that's the, the foundation with where we're going this morning. There's one God. And so anything having to do with those other lesser gods or those no gods does not matter. And so look what he says. He says, uh, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former associations with idols eat food as really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better if we do. But look at verse nine. If you have a pen, pencil, mascara, I don't care. Underline this in your Bible because this is a key point. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. At the, listen, at the end of the day, God, God has freed us from the price and penalty of sin. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his substitutionary atoning work and death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection that we just celebrated a few weeks ago, that has freed us from bonds and from penalties and everything else. And not only that, it has given us freedom to enjoy and have and be. But I'm fearful 
that far too often we use those liberties as crutches but also as uh, baseball bats to batter and beat others. Paul is saying it's not about liberty, it's about love. Liberty allows you to do things. And I can get specific if you want to. I don't feel like it's my place to necessarily get specific. Because if you think about it, when you've heard this passage before, if you've been in church for a long time, you hear this brought up about certain uh, recreational activities. And I don't want to limit it to just that because that's not the point. The point is this. Have you been freed and have you been given liberty to act and to live Yes. Does how you act and live matter? 100%. Jesus told the disciples, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. So there is this idea of both freedom and uh, accountability. We are free in Christ, yet we are accountable to Christ for how we enact that freedom. And so Paul is saying here that we have to take care that this right that we feel like we have that he has already said is okay doesn't cause somebody else to stumble because every one of us are on a journey and every one of us are at different levels in our faith journey. I'm grateful to God that when I I came to know Christ as my Savior, when God saved me, I didn't have to understand the depths of everything. I tell people all the time, coming to Christ literally means this. You give all that you know of yourself to all that you know of him in that moment. And think about it. What do we know about ourselves? It's not good. I know what's in here. I know what's in here and I know what comes out of here. And yet, what do we know about God? He is infinitely good, right? He is infinitely gracious. He is infinitely merciful. He infinitely loves us. And he demonstrated that love for us. So I'm thankful that in the the beginning moments of life, that's all I need to know. And there are people here today that that's where they are. That's the ground with which they've started. And we can't expect them to be further down the line where we are to know the things that we do. We have to teach them. And it's striking because it reminds me that people have eyes on us. Every one of you, there's somebody who looks to you. There's somebody who looks to you. There's somebody who follows you. There's somebody who mimics you. There's somebody who's wanting to see what you do and to do the same thing. And if you don't believe that, have kids. Kids never model the best of us. They usually model the worst of us. And I know that because I'm an East Carolina Pirates football fan. It's not funny. It's hurtful. It hurts. Like like that physically hurts me. Uh, And and to watch East Carolina football is a symphony of pain. And I have played that symphony for my children their entire lives. And it usually goes like this. First quarter, we play pretty good until... For some unknown reason, we think the other team should catch the ball we throw and then they should run it back for a touchdown. And I can remember staring at the TV, watching it, holding a pillow, screaming into the pillow, and then throwing the pillow across the room when said action happens. And then my four-year-old daughter, who loved me, maybe now not so much, but at that moment, she loved me. She would then grab a pillow and scream into it and throw it across the room. (laughs) She had no idea why she was doing it other than that's what was modeled for me to do. Look at what Paul says. He says, for someone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged or pushed forward if his conscience is weak to eat food sacrificed to idols? And so you, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. This brother for whom Christ died. Here's what he's saying. I, like, a food sacrifice to idols is nothing. Probably what was going on in the marketplace was they were going to buy meat or they were going to eat at some sort of place and 
they were talking with, and they found out that this, this meat was sacrificed. Well, this meat was probably cheaper because it was already cooked. And they're thinking to themselves, hey, uh, Piggly Wiggly has 14.95 steaks or 6.95 steaks. The only difference is these steaks were, were uh, offered to some God who I don't believe in and isn't real. Give me the cheap steaks. And then you've got a brother over here who, who has come out of that and maybe still struggles with it and maybe still doesn't, struggles with the comprehension and understanding of what that means. And they see you who is a deeper brother in the faith or sister in the faith and you're eating this and it really makes them struggle. And they say, well, I guess in order to be super faithful or super spiritual, I have to do the thing that gives me pause. There, there are things that, that I think we are free to do that I think about every time I do them. And I make sure that I'm doing it, number one, with the right heart, but I'm also doing it in a way that's not going to cause somebody to stumble. Like my, one of my biggest fears is that I cause somebody, Paul said, for whom Christ died, pain and suffering unnecessarily like we are not to cause one another pain and suffering the followers of Christ the believers of Christ the 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 the, the gathering together of like minded in community together should not cause one another pain knowingly and so here here Paul is and he's, he says this is a person for whom Christ died uh, look at verse 12 and 13, because verse 13 is, is, is the crux, and, and man, it's, it's pretty powerful. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So he said at the very beginning, hey, this isn't sin because it's nothing. Because food sacrificed to idols is nothing because gods are nothing. Idols are nothing, 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 nothing. It's fine. And then you know, a couple of paragraphs later, if you do this, and it causes a brother to sin, you've sinned against God. And then he says in verse 13, if eating food sacrificed to idols causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again. He, he doesn't say I won't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Make, make sure you take note of that. What does he say? I'll never eat meat. Because it matters. Because listen, our, our liberties are great, but our liberties are not the most important thing. They are just a thing. And so right here at the beginning, all I want you to see in chapter 8 is there were practices of liberty that were happening in the church that were on the surface okay. But because it caused a brother for whom Christ died to stumble, it was not okay. And Paul's saying, my liberty is not as important as something else. And that's where chapter 9 comes in. So flip over to chapter 9. And now we're about to take a dramatic turn and you're going to be like, I have no idea where Paul's going. Because sometimes Paul will say something and then say something and then go back to saying something. It's really crazy. And so Paul here goes now to chapter 9. I'm not going to read... The whole thing is it's like 20 some verses. But he then says, look, uh, in the first couple of verses, hey, I'm an apostle and I'm free to do these things and I'm free to be this person. I have the authority to do things that I need to do. And you might be thinking, what does that have to do with food sacrifice to idols? He's getting there. But I don't want you to miss that. Paul is setting up his authority to do things, his authority to have things. And what he is saying here is in the first 14 verses, I'm just going to summarize for him. 
I have a right to what's owed to me for what I do. Because when you read it, it's going to talk about, hey, uh, we could take a payment for what we do. We could accept gifts for what we do, but we're choosing not to. But I have every right to take them if I want to. I have every right to, to be able to be paid. He even says in, in those verses, uh, hey, me and Barnabas, we, we've gotten jobs and jobs are okay. And us getting paid uh, doing, a, uh, doing another job other than what we're doing is okay. And what he's basically saying is, I have a right, chapter eight, I have a right to eat food sacrificed to idols because idols are nothing. I have a right. I have a right to uh, liberty and freedom. Number two, I have a right to accept material possessions and monetary gain. And I have a right to that. And he lays it out. These things are okay and they are good. And then let's keep looking. He, he says things in, in chapter 9 like uh, verse 8. Do I say these on human authority? Uh, does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you should not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. It is for the oxen that God is concerned. Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope that the thre- and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? So he lays it out and says, hey, This is okay. This is fine. We're allowed to do this. Then he says, nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. But we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But verse 12, the second part, is the part I want to focus on. Uh, I, we endure, we have not made use of this, but we endure because, verse 15, but I have made no use of it to any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to ensure such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. And, and so, so here's the point. I can have this, I can do this, I choose not to have this, and I choose not to do this, not for my own sake, but that I can boast in something. And what is that something? What is the thing that Paul says is the grounds in his life for boasting? Because he's going to go on further a little bit here to say, um, uh, I have to preach, I'm in Plored to preach. I'm called to preach. So even the preaching of the gospel is not my joy. It is the means to the joy. And this might all this might all sound crazy and this might all sound scattered, but I promise at the end you're going to be able to see it. Because Paul is talking about something deeper. If we really are people who desire to go deeper, this is the deep stuff. And it's the idea that, that there are things we can have and we can do and we choose not to. And it's for one sole reason and purpose. And let's keep reading. For I, if I do this of my own will, verse 17, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. It's a stewardship to him. Verse 18, what then is my reward? Here it is that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right. For although, verse 19, I am free from all, I have made myself a servant of all, that I may win more people. And that's it right there. His chief joy, his chief hope, the chief thing that he finds is for people to find the joy in Christ. It's love. It's not want or need or care. It's love. Galatians 6.2 says that, that believers are to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. 
you're called to bear the burdens of other people. And that doesn't mean listen to them when they call on the phone, though that is part of it. And it doesn't mean to send them a, a nice text when they're going through hardships, but that's part of it. Bearing one another's burdens means to literally put yourself in their shoes and walk with them in the dirt, in the mire, in the rough, in the dark. And to sacrifice maybe freedoms or desires or needs that you have for them. That's tough. It's tough. The Christian life is not easy. And Paul says that this is my greatest reward. He says, to the Jews, verse 20, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means win some. And verse 23, if you've got your pen, pencil, and mascara again, this is a verse to circle. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul doesn't find value in his liberty. Paul doesn't find value in what he does or what he's owed. He finds value in people and specifically the reward that comes with the gospel that he might win more, that he might win Jews, that he might win those under the law, that he might win those outside the law, that he might win the weak, that he might share with them in the blessing. And what blessing is that? It's the blessing that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were enemies of God, that left to ourselves we would walk not closer to a Savior, but further away from a Savior. And yet God in his mercy and grace and wisdom chose in Jesus Christ to save us, to die for us, to forgive us, to show mercy upon those who don't deserve mercy and grace upon those who do not deserve grace. He chose us. He chose me. And he chose to love me. And forgive me. And man, I, I've just not gotten over that. And Paul's saying, that's my grace. But notice what he says. He doesn't say that they might share with me. He says that I might share with them. See, that's different. All of us like to receive gifts, don't we? If you're not, you're lying. You, everybody loves for somebody to buy you something pretty, okay? I love to give gifts. All the time. I, I love it. I love to see people's faces when they open and I try to think about the gifts I give people. I try to have them mean something. Uh, I buy my daughters stuffed animals uh, until I don't care if they're 52. I'm going to buy them stuffed animals. If they want a stuffy, I'm going to buy them a stuffy uh, because I want to keep them young forever. Don't want them to grow up. Meet icky boys. I don't want none of that. I want stuffed animals. But I, I love to give gifts. Why? Because I love to see what happens when they open it. And maybe for the first time they've received something that they wanted for a long time. Can you, can you picture what it looks like for someone to really understand the gospel for the first time? To understand who we are and yet who Jesus is to understand what we bring to the table and yet what God uh, graciously gives to all of us free of charge because he loves us, because we are created in his image and because he cares for us. Do you understand that? And Paul says, I will give up everything. 
He says, I'll give up my liberty. My liberty doesn't matter to me. Chapter 9, my rights don't matter to me. Money and material possessions don't matter to me. Recognition doesn't matter to me. My origin doesn't even matter to me. And my culture doesn't even matter to me. He said, I'm going to become a Jew to the Jews. I'm sorry, he's already a Jew. What does that mean? It means he had become so ingrained in what it means to be a believer that he almost had to retrain his mind to understand what a Jew was. That he loved people so much that he would do that. John Piper said this, we are never at home truly in any fallen culture because our true citizenship is in heaven, yet we are always at home because our Father owns the world. And it's this idea that, that nothing else matters. And I'm not saying your ethnicity doesn't matter. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in regards to the gospel, nothing should take precedent. Nothing should be more important. Why? Because we want to see people move from death to life, right? Right? We want to see people worship God in spirit and in truth. I, lo I love worshiping God. I, I love uh, standing down there and worshiping with our, with our praise team. I, I love it. I, I love uh, when, when they sing wondrous songs of who God is, when they lead us to remind ourselves of the joy and the beauty and the wonder and the hope that is found in Jesus. I love it. Because we, because we desperately need that in our lives. Do you need hope? I would think so. Do you need grace and mercy? I would hope so. I desperately need it. I want everyone in the world to know that there is a father in heaven that loves them regardless of whatever father or mother or family they ever had. I've been studying a lot the idea of Abba Father. You ever read those passages, the Abba Father passages? I've always kind of wondered what those mean, why, uh, why God is called Abba. It means more than daddy. It, 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 it has this connotation of, of being the one who is there when you need him, like a dad would be. I want people to know that Abba Father, but I... I never fully understood it till I had a friend who um, explained it to me in a powerful way. And, and if you don't mind, I'd like to do that this morning. I had a buddy who adopted two young boys from the Ukraine. And in the adoption process, the international adoption process, sometimes they would have you come on a visit. And you would come and for a week you would visit and you would meet your two your children, one or two, he was adopting two. You would meet your children. You would see where they live. You would, you would walk amongst them. You would, you would be in the orphanage with them. You would see their life. But there would be a time where you'd have to leave and you'd have to finish up paperwork and, and visas and all that, and then you'd come back. And he was telling this story about when he went to the orphanage in the Ukraine and he's walking with the, with the director of the orphanage, and he said they're walking the halls and the halls... It's like a morgue in there. Nobody's talking. You hear no noises. But yet he would look in the rooms and he would see these little children holding on to the cribs and they'd be looking out and clearly they knew you were there and clearly they know they saw you but they didn't make a sound. And, he's, and he asked the director, he said, why, why, aren't, they, why aren't they making a sound? He, and the director said, well, we don't have enough workers to hold these kids so after a while they would stop crying when no one came to them. And so he told the story that uh, they spent the week with their kids. And they kissed on them, loved them, you know, showed them, talked to them, shared that they were going to be their mom and dad. And then the gut-riching moment happened where they had to leave them. And uh, so they placed them back down in their crib and they say goodbye temporarily. They say, we'll be back. We're coming back for you. 
And they walk out of the room and they turn the corner and the two boys just fall into their crib and start screaming to the top of their lungs. And the reason is is because they knew for the first time in their life that somebody heard them when they cried. Friends, that's what I want everyone to experience. I want them to know that there's an Abba Father out there that gives a rip about them. And I don't care if I've got to give up liberty and eating meat or drinking out. It doesn't, like, it doesn't matter. That, that's, that pales in comparison if I've got to give up some stupid freedom so that someone for the first part in their time in their life can know the love of Jesus Christ. Paul saying, I've become all things to all people so that by all means I can win some. We're called to love people, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And the way that we glorify God is to be satisfied in Him so much that nothing else matters. There's a world outside of this place who needs something. I think they need their Abba Father. And if that means I've got to sacrifice some stuff, so be it. I hope you'll pray about that today. If you're here today and you don't know that Abba Father, He loves you desperately. He cares about you desperately. He died for you completely. if you're here today and you you've never tasted and seen that the Lord is good if I have to give up meat for you to do it I'll do it oh that we're changed by this folks that we walk out of here and we don't hold our heads high thinking we know something, but we, we bow our heads in reverence to the one who knows everything, created everything, and yet chose to love us in spite of it. And we take that to the world. God, thank you for today and for your blessings. Um, God, for, for how you love us, how you care for us and how you demonstrated that in that while we were still sinners, while we were literally at our worst, you died for us. God, help us not to hold our freedoms up as a barrier to people, but to cast them down as a worthy offering for something far greater. Lord, I thank you for each one here. I pray you do work in their hearts and minds as we worship you, the only King, the only Lord, and the only God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.